Thank you so much for being here. And thank you, thank for, you for making a wonderful film. I loved it so much. I, I honestly feel like I was ranting and raving about it backstage. It's so beautiful looking. And I didn't even get to talk about the story and how you wrote it and your take on the original, which was so smart and interesting. Let's sort of start there. You know, a lot of people have already said that thank this you. is like a, oh yeah, you're, you're very welcome, uh, has said that this is like a, a feminist reworking of the original The Beguiled, which was directed by Don Siegel, starring Clint Eastwood, two sort of well-known macho male Hollywood conservatives. Yeah. Great filmmakers, uh, but really well-known <laughs> for those beliefs in some ways. Was that your intention right away? Did you feel like you were doing a feminist sort of reworking of it? Well, when I saw the story, it's about a group of women and uh, an enemy soldier comes in and, and the Don Siegel film is very much from, from that character's, Clint Eastwood's character's point of view. So I thought because it's about a group of women, I'd love to kind of reimagine what the story would be like from their point of view and tell the same story from their view. And, th and I went back to the book, which is written from each, all the female characters' point of view. And, and yeah, so that was the, the aim. You know, all the little Colin only has a little beard sticking out of this poster. It's really making me laugh. It's just this little. It's not about him. It's yeah. about the ladies. Exactly. One, one of the things that I've I, I've i found that you did that was different from the original was that you removed a lot of the sort of um, reasoning that uh, that the, that that film and story gave those characters, and you injected a lot more ambiguity, which lent itself to a much. Uh, a much more interesting take on the women. Obviously, you're telling the story from their point of view, but by not attaching certain reasons to them and to Colin Farrell's character, everything's more open to question. Yeah, I thought it'd be more interesting and intriguing if you didn't know right off the bat he's a bad guy, or you know that that there were more sides to him as more complex, and hopefully you go along through the women's characters' point of view of trying to figure him out. So I just thought it was more interesting. And, and with them in the in the 70s movie, there were kind of these backstories that I didn't want to include, and I wanted to make them more human and sympathetic, hopefully. Ed, uh, do you do you feel like he's a he's a bad I mean, I have my own take on him. I, I don't think he's a good guy necessarily, but do you think he's a he's a bad guy? I think he's trying to survive. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do, too. He's manipulating his way into staying, you know, so he, yeah, so he can survive. And he's also sort of manipulating these women who he clearly views as specific archetypes of, of femininity. Yeah, I mean, we have girls at different ages from 12 to um, women in their 40s. And he's um, he has to f figure out how to play each one and what they need. And so he's a big brother to the little girl and he's, you know, uh, going to take her away. Or it, so he has to figure them all out and we kind of see him playing them and he's a, like a playboy. Talk about your character, Edwina, a really beautiful performance and a, a, a character that I don't know if we've really seen you play before. No, she's very different from me. Sophie always says, my dimple doesn't even come out in this movie. I'm, I'm so tightly wound and conservative and um, repressed. My ankles are showing today. It's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> very crazy. Uh, but Edwina, you know, we bring in this enemy and, and she's obviously very angry and scared, and but she also has to put up a front of a good, you know, Christian woman and an example for the young girls. And then all these other feelings are bubbling up because, you know, obviously he manipulates her, uh, Colin's character does, into liking him and, and promising her that she can be taken away from here and a, a different life. And, and then she has Miss Martha, who's who she, she's under Miss Martha's thumb as well. So Edwina is... A lot of things are happening for Edwina, but she also is very reserved and doesn't say them. Do you think that Edwina wants an escape or is desperate for an escape from this from this house, or more has to do with the moment and this person coming in and sort of swooping her off her feet? I think... Swooping, <laughs> swooping sorry. <laughs> Whatever, swooping, swooping. Yeah. We got you. <laughs> um, I think that she... It awakens something in her, but I don't think she's happy there you know and also they're very it's they're very isolated and cut off because it's during the wartime and they haven't been around anyone outside of this group of women they haven't been around a man in years and so they are very cut off i talk about i don't want to give anything away in the film even though there is the original <laughs> you can kind of go watch that and you stick generally i think to kind to the original but like i said remove certain things and shoot it in your own style and tell it from their point of view but it never feels heavy-handed it never feels at any point like you're like this one is about this now versus the other one yeah no it's just focused more on the female characters because that's what was interesting to me but um the premise and the plot is the same and i thought it was such a fun 
uh, or interesting premise because it talks a lot about power between men and, and women and things that are universal. I, I showed it to some friends when we were editing, and, and a friend said, "Oh, I dated that guy." And there's still, you know, there, there are dynamics that are, are universal, but um, it's interesting to see it through, you know, the lens of the past and, and kind of escape into another setting. Well, one of the things that I think is is universal and timeless is uh, misogyny, and the way that his um, the way that his misogyny sort of comes out when he's eventually threatened. You know, all of these sort of mythical ideas about women that are based in misogyny end up sort of bubbling to the surface in this moment where he's threatened, and he's also sort of trying to backtrack and skirt his own responsibility for for what he did. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I liked that um, it was. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that it has all these. Um, it's kind of the original was like a man's fantasy turned nightmare, and there's elements of that. And his character makes a big shift where he thinks he's coming into this very not threatening world, and then things uh, things don't turn out the way that he planned. We also, yeah, we do something very horrible to him. I don't want to give anything away, but anyone would be angry. <laughs> Do, uh, do do you, though? Because I, I, I took that scenario as that that was what was necessary. They take charge of the situation, and it's brutal times. It's wartime, and, they, um, and they're, they're strong. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was necessary, but it's the buildup to all of it, yeah. too. I mean, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to talk about and not give it away, like yeah. I said. But, yeah, it's a slow burn, and, and I think, um, yeah, he, t he has to turn at some point. That's... This, yeah. the story, you know? I, I, I hope it's fun for the audience to go along on the journey of whether you should trust him or not and then what happens. I was on their side the whole time, to be honest. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, at the, even at the end, I was like, good, screw that guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talk about the look of the film. It's so beautiful. And I don't know if I've ever seen a film shot this way. I, I, it's incredible looking. Oh, that's so nice. We had a wonderful cinematographer, Philippe Lassord, and we got to shoot on location in New Orleans, um, in a real real houses of the time. I and read uh, that it was Jennifer Coolidge's house? The, the interior. One of the houses. Yeah. Sorry, Seth. No, no. The interior was, and then we shot at a real plantation for the exteriors, which it's so beautiful, but then has the you know very dark history. And, and so I think it all lended a lot of to the atmosphere. What were your, uh, when you sat down to work with your DP on what the film was going to look like, what, what did you talk about? What, what did you look at? We, we looked at a lot of um, paintings and photographs and just making this uh, very soft, kind of gauzy, feminine world that I really want to have a contrast from the world of these southern ladies and the, you know, the war which, and, the, and the man that comes in and so masculine. So to have a real contrast and, and to really feel like you're in, in, in the south at this other time. And, and feel like the light was the real light of that time. Sort of as much natural light as possible? Yeah, we, we had um, lots of camera tests for which candles we could make more light that we could use. And um, so we, we, a lot of planning went into the look that I hope that the audience can really feel transported to another time. Absolutely. Um, now, you, you're in a, Edwina's in this family with Nicole Kidman's character and, and Elle Fanning's character and the other, the other girls that are in the movie. Yeah, family metaphorically. Family yes, metaphorically, yes, excuse we're me. we're not related. Um, what was it like sort of creating those family dynamics? Did you guys hang out at all beforehand? Did you get together and, and, and work on your characters? Well, we, we definitely had a, a period of time before we shot where we all got to know each other and we had etiquette classes and just little Our things. etiquette of, classes like? I'm sorry. They're, I, it's it entertaining point, because it's no things idea. that you would never know. Like, I remember in the beginning we all like run out of the house, but you could never pick up, it's hard to do with the microphone, you could never pick up your skirt with two hands. Um, you'd always have to brush it to the side and then hold it with your other hand. So like little just mannerisms a of a good, of su time. yeah, like of a, of a southern, southern woman. That's so crazy to imagine a woman being chastised for not doing something that specific it, with their dress. It, it's all about sh not showing your, like any part of your Which would be body. vulgar. <laughs> But, uh, and also something like that is, is connected to this movie in some capacity in the sense that we talk about the way women are criticized or thought of in the past and how misogyny is sort of built off of these myths, just the way that women are criticized now and for the way that they look and the way that they act more than men. I mean, obviously that has a historical precedent when you're talking about etiquette class and women having to move their dress to the right or to the left. Yeah, there were a lot of, you know, the role of, roles of women at that time were very, you know, a lot of ideas about that, which, you know, we... 
we can still feel, but in that it was in a really extreme way. And we looked at etiquette books that would tell you, you know, how women should behave. And so much of it was about how to be f towards men. And then the characters in this movie found themselves without any men around and had to find their own roles. Right, so this is, it's this idea that there's no man around and they're trained to be around men and to act a certain way around men. And finally, like, a man shows up and they get to put their training into practice. Yeah, yeah. Um, Nicole Kidman's character kind of uses when he comes to invite him to the table for the girls to learn how to entertain a gentleman. But there were a lot of roles of ladies at that at that time, which you know I'm sure has trickled down into modern life. Now, there's uh, in the original film, there's definitely like a, a sort of campy pulp factor to the original film, and I I feel like you you didn't do that that much in this one at all. But you do have moments with looks and playful glances, but be, but. Be, between the women, can you talk about sort of fi finding that tone and never sort of going over the line? Yeah, part of what I loved about the story were, were the kind of interaction with women, the way that's so unique um, in, in this kind of all the nonverbal communication with the glance and the tone. And I thought there was a lot of humor in the story that we wanted to have, but also not go into full camp. So to kind of balance between the humor and the emotional drama of the characters and the actress has always kept it really um, connected to something real, I think. Yeah, and when you have those cute little girls and they're like dressing up with their earrings because, <laughs> yeah, it's fun to see all these different age groups working together too. It's like, you know, young girls to, to late 40s. How did you assemble the cast? When I was first thinking about the story, I thought, oh, I'd love... You know, Kirsten could play the teacher, and Elle Fanning, who the last time I worked with, she was 11. I thought now she's old enough to play the older student. And um, how how old is her character supposed to be? She's supposed to be like 17, okay. and and Elle just turned 18 when we were filming, so it was her first location film without a chaperone. So Kirsten looked out for her. She could work those and, real hours uh, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. True. yeah we, yeah. <laughs> I know we, um, we'd lose little girls as we as we filmed because they had to go to school. So Elle would fill in for like most of the characters uh, in the dining room table scene when, when you know, it was a close up on me or Nicole or Elle. Like usually the little girls weren't there anymore because they had to go to school. They have a l limited hours that they can work. So. And then once Nicole had to go to the CMT awards and so Elle filled in at the, it was like my last line of the movie and Elle was Miss Martha for me. So Elle, Elle was like really loving her new hours that she could work really. Yeah. <laughs> she put them to you. Yeah. yeah, she played all the all the girls. Uh, talk about Nicole Kidman's character. It's an it's an amazing performance by Nicole, Kid, Nicole Kidman, and she's such an iconic actress at this at this point. It's you have to cast her as the as the matriarch, really. Yeah, I just I've always loved her, and I pictured her as the the headmistress when I was writing the script. It really helped me to picture her, and and she just brings, you know, so much. It, humor and emotion and really made the character feel real and she could have easily just turned into like a, a villain but she makes her I think human and sympathetic and um and and she just felt like she could be the headmistress of this world did any, such a lady did any of uh, any of the actresses watch the original movie and did you show that to I mean if they did watch it would your sort of direction be like you know don't do that <laughs> I well I tried to forget about them. After I saw the movie, I tried to forget about it and go back to the book and then just really imagine it. If I wanted to do it my own way. But I had sent it to Kirsten a long time ago. Yeah, so f she was like, what, what, check out this movie. I think I'm going to remake it. So I watched it about three years ago. I haven't watched it since then. Um, but for instance, like Clint Eastwood's kissing a six-year-old within like the second scene. So I knew that <laughs> Sophia would have a very different take, but I also knew that why she was attracted to, you know, all these women together in, in a film. I just watched the trailer, the original trailer for the the old beguiled, and in it, it goes Clint Eastwood, man, sexual enemy, <laughs> like really weird times. Funny, it was. It's very seventies. The other one, I mean, it's it's fun to watch, but it's it's a totally different thing. And the women are crazy and deranged, and I tried to make them, you know, human and relatable. Well, that's so interesting because you talk about Nicole Kidman bringing hum humanity to the character and not playing her as some sort of deranged, crazy woman. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that was something that you, in upon giving the script, or if you felt like your script already sort of portrayed her as that, and you expected her not, as an actress not to go in that direction. Yeah, I think in, when I was writing the script, I was thinking about that character and I wanted her to, to have dignity and um, you know, and all these qualities. So I think uh, I think I wrote it in a different way than the uh, '70s one. Oh, oh, we haven't talked about the man in the movie yet because uh, his beard is cut off. But Colin Farrell, uh, really the hunk yeah. of the of the movie, the stud, if you will, and really 
playing it up and it seems like having a good time playing it up. Did you yeah. talk to him about that beforehand and be like, we're really going to exploit you here, Colin? Yeah, he was really a good sport. He knew that he was the uh, sex object. and um, But also we respect him as an actor. Oh, yeah. And he's so right. charming and charismatic. And, and I just, I, I knew he would bring so much to it. And, and he, yeah, he's really charming and he could really, the way he is with each one of them, can, he can be really a different side of himself. And and he has a dark side. That and, yeah, he has that, and he's so intelligent, too. So it, if, if we had had an actor that didn't have that depth, it would make us look silly for falling for him. But because he's such a good actor, and you see that there's more behind his eyes, and he's a soulful, soulful person, he can manipulate us, and we don't look, you know, like... Yeah. <laughs> it also, it also. <laughs> I remember us talking about that. It also takes a good actor and one, like you said, that at least looks like they have depth to sort of give those scenes, those montages that you have of him kind of like gardening oh. and pouring our, water over a romance his body. novel sequence. Yeah, to make those funny, but at the same time not so over the top funny that it pulls oh, you winking. out of the movie. Like I laughed hysterically, but I was still really enjoying the movie. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah, no, we never wanted him to be winking, but he did play it up for us when we were shooting those. He was like really, he knew he was. Do you have outtakes of him going even further? I, yeah, I think so. And we were we, we joke about we were shooting stills for the calendar, and he was really you know hamming it up, but 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 always taking it seriously. He was yeah. Could you compile an outtake for real yeah. for for we, the world? <laughs> I think they would really enjoy it. No, yeah. Colin would be so happy. Yeah, with that. no, I don't, stick to the calendar yeah. maybe. Yeah, but he was really a good sport and like gave it to us. Uh, let's get some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, first question right here. Hi. How are you? Hi, good, thank you. Um, my question is, I wanted to know, sorry, this was for Kirsten. Um, how did you mentally prepare for this character? Because you're saying it's so different and like your dimple wasn't even showing. So how were you able to prepare and then to execute it? What was the last part, sorry? To, then like once you prepare, then to execute that character. Okay, got it. Um, I, I work with someone and, and she referenced Lord of the Flies at one point, which makes a lot of sense because they're all, you know, the power struggles and, and the new laws that are made and the ridiculous things that happen when you're sequestered and claustrophobic, in this claustrophobic environment with a, a lot of people. Um, but for me, I guess, you know, I, I couldn't relate to Edwina. She felt much younger, like part of a younger piece of myself. So I just kind of tapped into that. And then, you know, it was fun to have that one scene where I, um, well, it's towards the end of the movie. Well, I shouldn't say I talk about it, probably. Never mind. Um, but it was fun to play someone, yeah, who's so repressing, then gets to break out of that. Kirsten, I feel like uh, in the last, like, six or seven years, you've always done really great work, but, like, your choices have been totally inspired every movie or even Fargo in the last, like, five or six, seven years. What what do you think you owe that to? When did, did that just start? Did you just start being like, I want to do whatever I want, and I want to do the things that interest me? I felt, personally, I feel like I've always tried to do that. I mean, Sophie and I made Virgin Suicides together when I was 16, and I had just done this weird movie, Dick, this comedy. and. Dick is the best. <laughs> See, so it's not like I'm like suddenly making like indie films. I don't understand. Like I've always done that balance. Um, but yeah, I, I've been doing this long enough. I deserve to do what I want. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, next question. Hi. So I'm a big fan of another film you just mentioned, The Virgin Suicide. So Sophia, I was wondering what the difference was between adapting that for screen, it's just a book, and then this, which is a book and also an old film, and the process for both of you was like for that. Oh, thank you. Well, when I first saw The Beguiled, it reminded me of Virgin Suicides, and so I kind of went back to the that world and that aesthetic and the kind of the, the dreamy quality. And But I really tried to forget the other film and just go back to the book and adapt that um, in the same way that I had done Virgin Suicides, where you just look at the book about what you want to include and which characters you, you want to focus on and which ones you, you can't. There's only enough time to do so much. You have to really focus on who you want to include and and the approach. Can I ask, how did you how did you come across The Beguiled? Not the book, but the, the movie. You say you saw the movie first and then went to the book. How did yeah, you my, come across the movie? Um, my friend Ann Ross, who's the production designer of the film, told me about it. And she kind of and she said to me, you need to see this movie, The Beguiled. I think you need to remake it. Kind of in kind of in a joking way. And I, I would never imagine ever remaking someone else's film. But then when I saw it, I knew what she was talking about it and it stayed in my mind and there was a connection to Virgin Suicides. It felt somehow kind of related but then going in a much different direction and and for me it was interesting to try to make a genre film and very like southern gothic but how to do that in my own way in my own style uh, next question i think we have time for one more hi 
Um, I'm curious how you integrate music into this film because I picture so vividly Kirsten, you running through the halls of Versailles um, and Marie Antoinette kind of outpouring to the strokes. <laughs> and I'm wondering how, do you use contemporary music in this film or is it different? Um, yeah, it's different. This time we don't have any um, contemporary music. It, 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 there's a score, my husband's band Phoenix did the score, but it's very restrained and like um, synthesizer tonal music that's very um, under, under the surface because I wanted to have a lot of tension and just really um, and not have songs that would alleviate the tension. So it's it's very um, it has a score, but very minimal, and it, and and a lot of awareness on the sounds of nature with the sound design of the cicadas and the cannons in the distance. And I, I hope that it, you feel the tension. Um, and so there's a different approach to the music. And with the exception of the credit and you saying that, there's really no sense that it's Phoenix doing the oh, score. Yeah, no, yeah. It's very. I didn't even realize that when yeah. I watched it <laughs> after you said that. I was like, oh, they did. That? You know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's not. It, it doesn't sound like what they do at all. But how, how do you go about choosing the the music from your movies? I mean, I think going back to the Virgin Suicides and and going with the Air. You introduced me to the band Air, and I I love uh, that band. And, oh, cool. You know, and then uh, Marie Antoinette like throwing New Order in there, and uh, uh, Gang of Four, like some really awesome bands that. Oh. do not apply to that particular period of time. Yeah, just for each movie, I think you fi I, I find the music that relates to it. And I, when I was writing the script for Virgin Suicides, I was staying in London and I was in a record store and I found the Air out their first album, which I'd never heard of them. And I, I asked the guy at the record store if it was any good. He said, yeah, and I, I listened to it. So I listened to it a lot when I was writing that script. And then I thought, oh, this could be the... Um, this this feels like the soundtrack. This it feels like the tone of the movie. Was it Moon Safari? The no, it was album? Premier Premier Symptoms, their, oh, their right. first record, oh, yeah, the first and that's how I knew about them. But only because I randomly got it at a record store, and um, and then yeah, listening to it, I thought, oh, that could be the music. And um, and then when we were doing Marie Antoinette, it reminded me of that 18th century was how I remember from like new romantic videos and Adam Ant and and all those bands so and because they were teenagers I really wanted to have that feeling of kind of irreverent teen spirit I, I love Marie Antoinette I think it was a vastly underrated film for the time and I think people are going to consistently rediscover it and and talk about it it's a really brave film that the two of you made no one had done anything yeah. like that since I just yeah. feel like it's unique and I'm happy that that people still come up and tell us that they enjoyed it so yeah I still get Marie Antoinette all and people Instagram it all the time too oh, it's really? such a ref it <laughs> it's true it's such a pretty film it's like people don't make films that beautiful anymore and Sophia does you know and nobody makes uh, we're not going to stay on this too long I think I actually have to let you go but nobody makes nobody has the kind of courage to make uh comedies of any kind of that time and ha inject humor and a kind of contemporary uh idea of those moments they romanticize and and glamorize a sort of stiffness consistently when it comes to those periods. Yeah, I wanted to, you know, be playful with it and, and try to do like the opposite of like a historical drama. I mean, I wanted to have the history in it too, but more have the feeling of, of this girl becoming a woman and, and what, it was, what it was like for her and more the impression of that. I remember Not you saying too it always stuck in my head, like no shafts of light. Cause like always in period films, you're always getting these like lights that come through the window and Soph was always like, no shafts of light. <laughs> That's so funny, I don't remember I that. that but. Yeah. Uh, well, guys, I, I love The Beguiled. I can't wait to see it again and take more from it. When when can audiences uh, see the film? It's uh, coming out in limited theaters this weekend, and then it goes wide um, the 30th. July 30th? What month? Are we? June 30th. <laughs> anyway, but I hope people go see it in the theater because we shot it on film for a big screen, and I think it's really fun to see with other people and to laugh and get freaked out together. So I think it's a fun communal experience that I hope people will do. Yeah, don't do that to yourself. See this on the big screen. Don't watch this at home. It's such a, a incredible cinematography and just a beautiful film. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you so you. much. For Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you.